Now I want to bring in our Nick Robertson, our senior international diplomatic editor, who joins us live from Geneva, where the Syrian peace talks have been taking place. Uh, Nick, what has been the reaction there? Well, there's no reaction yet from the opposition, uh, but there certainly are a number of ways to read this. Um, one of them is very clearly uh, that from what we've seen so far, the Syrian government hasn't come here to Geneva to engage in substantive discussions. They met with Stefan de Mistura today uh, and they wanted to talk about procedural issues rather than substantive issues. This seems to back up what we'd heard from their foreign minister over the weekend, that President Assad was a red line, that they weren't willing to negotiate on that. And of course, we heard US Secretary of State John Kerry's remarks about that, saying that this was down to President Putin now to, to make his move. Um, certainly, the Russians have the strongest leverage over the Syrian government uh, ju to judge what, Russia, what uh, the Russian troop deployments will be over the next few days based on what President Putin has said, I think really we have to wait and see particularly uh, the details of how that plays out. But the reality is here that Russia has been under a lot of pressure. We don't necessarily see that pressure per se, but it's been under pressure from Saudi Arabia, its Gulf Sunni Arab allies, who have essentially said to Russia, what is the future that you want? Do you want a future that is only you and the Shia countries, Iran, uh, friends with Syria, friends with Hezbollah in Lebanon? Is that the future that you want? Or would you like a relationship with the Sunni nations as well? You can have both. But your actions over the coming days are going to be clear. This is what I've been hearing on background. Diplomatic channels has been the message coming from the Sunni Arabs to President Putin. Other sources have been telling me that there are uh, stockpiles on the border of surface-to-air weapons. So a plan B um, for certainly some countries' ideas might have been to supply the rebel opposition groups with surface-to-air missiles to bring down aircraft. And it's not altogether disconnected that in the past couple of days there were suspicions that a, an either a Syrian or Russian fighter jet over Syria was brought down by a surface-to-air missile. We don't know if these events are, are properly connected or not, but it certainly is a warning potentially for President Putin that to stay engaged in a situation where the Syrian government doesn't want to negotiate, you back that position, the war continues. It could be a very costly war and a lengthy war at that. So that sort of pressure exists on President Putin. There's an economic and financial pressure as well. Other diplomats have told me that the plan B would be economic pressure. If the talks failed and President Putin and Russia were seen to be to blame for not pushing and pressuring President Bashar al-Assad's government to really compromise, then there could potentially be economic sanctions on Russia. It was interesting a few weeks ago at the Munich talks, the international Syria support group who got the cessation of hostilities going and the delivery of humanitarian aid that was their agreement over the same weekend and in the following few days Saudi Arabia and Russia agreed a freeze in oil production uh, to not change their levels um, there had been rumors that they might even uh, reduce the level of production and now allow the price of oil to rise that would have benefited Russia of course all these things cannot be seen in isolation so when we're at this stage in the talks here, in the next few minutes, the UN Special Envoy here will be briefing the UN Security Council in New York about how the talks are going. And he'll be characterizing how his meeting went with the Syrian government today. And, and if it's similar to the way he characterized it to journalists here today, it will in, in effect imply that the Syrian government isn't here to negotiate or hasn't arrived yet to negotiate the future of the country, which is what the UN Security Council expects. Therefore, focus and pressure will turn towards Russia. When you analyze all of that, you have to look at President Putin's actions or words in that context. But the implications, is it pressure on the Syrian government? Is it rather to show the UN Security Council and US Secretary of State John Kerry and, uh, and President Obama that he is pressuring the Syrian government? Is it a smokescreen? Um, I think really that's why I say we have to look at what happens on the ground because that's when we can determine not what the words say, but what actually happens and therefore the impact that that will have on the Syrian government. But potentially, this can be a very serious event, a substantial event, potentially can be, and I use those words advisedly, um, as these talks here need to get serious, which is the view of the diplomats who are watching this from the sidelines here.
Okay, Nick Robertson, stand by. I understand we now have uh, the Russian President Vladimir Putin speaking uh, from uh, the state TV. Let's have a listen to this. I believe that the goal set out to the Ministry of Defense and the Armed Forces has overall been fulfilled, and that's why I order the Minister of Defense as of tomorrow to start the pullout of the main part of our military grouping from the Syrian Arab Republic. Obviously, no doubt, a huge shock. I, I've, I've got uh, Frederick Plackton with us here from London as well. Uh, Fred, you've spent a lot of time in Syria. Just explain what sort of difference the Russians made. Well, they made a, a big difference. You know, I was there about four weeks ago, uh, and one of the main things that we focused on uh, in our reporting from the north of Syria, from the area around Aleppo, was to ask government forces and to ask top-level Syrian government officials just what effect uh, the Russian air campaign has had for them. And literally everywhere that we get went, whether it was the highest level of the Syrian government, whether or not it was troops on the front line, they always said that the Russian intervention uh, in Syria for them had been decisive. If you asked uh, the soldiers on the front line in the battlefield, they said, of course, the Russian bombings made a big difference for them, especially uh, in the area in the northwest of Syria, uh, in the Latakia area, but also north of Aleppo uh, as well. They said that they were able to make significant gains uh, because of the Russian bombing campaign. But they said uh, one thing that was almost as important as the Russian airstrikes themselves was the aerial intelligence that they were getting from the Russians. They said that they had, the Russians had drones in the air, they had spy planes in the air, and it was something uh, that allowed them to track rebel movements. But also, quite frankly, I was in an area uh, that had the front line between the Syrian government and ISIS. And they said the same thing with ISIS as well, is that they could track ISIS's movements, they could direct their fire uh, more uh, better uh, by having this uh, aerial intelligence. So they said that it was certainly uh, something that made a very big difference there on the battlefield. Uh, and especially if you look at the area around Aleppo, which certainly was the focal point shortly before the ceasefire, they believe that they would have not have been able to make the gains that they did if the Russians hadn't been there. The other thing that seemed pretty clear there on the ground is that there did also appear to be Russian specialists on the ground helping to direct the fire, possibly also Russian hardware as well. So this was a fairly large military campaign that was going on on the part of the Russians. It's going to be interesting to see what sort of presence they keep there, how many planes they keep there, whether or not this for the Russians means uh, that they'll completely stop their bombing campaign. Maybe uh, they'll continue to go after groups like Jabhat al-Nusra and ISIS and cease their uh, campaigns against groups that have been determined by the ceasefire to be part of the political negotiations. But certainly, uh, it's very difficult to overstate the impact uh, that uh, the Russian air campaign has had on the dynamics of the battlefield in Syria. And it's certainly clear that everyone in the Syrian government, all the way to the highest levels, uh, know just how much of a difference these bombings have made, Linda. And also, uh, of course, Russia has come under fire for uh, targeting mm. civilians in Syria with yeah. its airstrikes. What do you think the reaction will be uh, from the Syrians? Well, I mean, it's certainly on the uh, opposition-held areas, there will be a sigh of relief because it, it, it does appear as though, if you look at the uh, international reports, if you look at a lot of the things that have come out uh, from activist groups, from opposition groups, they say, of course, that there have been uh, major civilian casualties, that a lot of these airstrikes uh, were not very accurate, that in some cases they believe that the uh, Russians deliberately uh, targeted civilian installations like markets, like potentially hospitals as well. As Matthew alluded to before, this is something that the Russians have uh, totally denied, but certainly on the one hand, you'll see people breathing a sigh on the reef. On the other hand, though, in areas that are very pro-government, for instance, the area around Tartus, there are many people who praised the Russians. I was in, uh, in one town, uh, a Shiite town in the north of Syria called Nubal, uh, that had just been, uh, that had been under siege by rebel forces and uh, that uh, the Russians had just helped uh, the Syrian government take back. And there were pictures of Vladimir Putin all over that place, also in many other uh, government installations. You could see people praising uh, the Russians. So certainly, depending on which side of the equation you're on, uh, the uh, Syrian uh, uh, opposition will certainly be breathing a sigh of relief. But there will certainly be some people in the government and also uh, in the Syrian military who will be quite uneasy about this move and wanting to see what exactly it means.
Absolutely, and, and how soon Russia could ramp up uh, their involvement mm. if need be. Uh, Nick Robertson, just back to you. How much hope is there there now? And uh, what will be expected? What do you think we'll hear when, when, when the, uh, the UN Special Envoy to Syria speaks? You know, I think we can expect the, the you know, a, a, a tiny fraction of, of greater hope. It's really just too soon to say, but it's, but it's Russia, really, that everyone feels holds the cards, and President Putin in particular. It's his actions that everyone has been watching. I don't think this was quite uh, expected. Um, certainly, there were no hints of it uh, around the margins of the talks here today and, and from diplomats here as well. There, was no, there were no hints of this that we were aware of. But I think it certainly will encourage people to believe that the dynamic in Syria is not wholly fixed and wholly entrenched. And if President Putin's remarks are intended to galvanize the Syrian government delegation to realize that their principal and most important backer um, is perhaps not going to be as firmly behind them as he has been until now, that is perhaps a sort of message that can get them to come to the table and make substantial negotiations, which hasn't happened before. The talks here failed earlier in the year. Two years ago, we were in exactly the same situation when the talks failed in Geneva too, early 2014. And, and who got the blame for it? Essentially, uh, that Russia got the blame for not pressuring the Syrian government to make compromise. The question earlier today had been, will it be the same again this time? And I think we have to look at that question now and say, well, maybe not. We don't know the answer yet. Linda? Okay, Nick Robertson, live for us in Geneva, and Frederick Plankton from London. Great to have you both with us. Thank you very much. And we will continue uh, on this breaking news that Russia is pulling out a large part of its military from Syria. It's expected to happen as early as Tuesday. That was this edition of CNN Newsroom. Armin Poor is next with more on this story. Stay with us right here at CNN.